Right, thank you very much. Um, what's the pointer? I, I would just like to say before I start that the observations and conclusions made here were made independent of what Jenny has just said. This is, uh, and, and it forms a really quite a nice extra test to what uh, Jenny was just talking about as well with respect to uh, carboniferous lungfish in the Devonian. But on, on with the show. The picture here you have in the background is of the Russian paleontologist Dmitry Obrachev collecting fossils from the shore of the river Stolbo in Russia in about 1937. And uh, Stolbo, there are exposures of Franian age rocks. Uh, it just lies to the, to the east of St. Petersburg. And here's uh, a picture taken of Stolbo in about 19, the 1920s. It's, uh, you can see what happened in the springtime. They'd let the logs flow down the river, and the logs would scour the banks, creating some beautiful exposure where people would go and look for fossils, Obrachev himself. Um, and this is no longer exposed because this logging no longer occurs like this. So Obrachev was instrumental in documenting the fish from this site in the 1920s all the way up to the 1960s. And he described Agnathan's uh, Antioch and Athrodi placoderms, and subsequent to his work, there's work done on Botryolepids and, and Calthodians, Osteoleporforms, and Elpistus degalians. Um, Elpistus degalians. But it wasn't until the 1990s that the first lungfish was described from this locality. And this is in part because the material is very, very fragmentary. It wasn't, or isn't rather, very good material to work with. This was the first. Um, genus described, the first specimen, and it uh, was assigned by Natasha Krupina to the, the long snouted genus Rhinodipterus. Um, in her analysis, though, she didn't do a phylogenetic analysis. She just made a description and a comparison. And some new observations show that the E bone, which runs down the, the, the middle of the snout there, is not actually a single bone, as she said, but it's paired. Uh, and also on the parasphenoid, this very, very elongated parasphenoid there. It has denticles on it. So it's very much doubtful that this actually lies within Rhinodipterus itself. And as I mentioned, here's some of the, the, the very fragmentary material. But just on the theme of parasphenoids again, there's a lot of diversity of parasphenoids. And look, of particular note, they have extremely long stalks. Where have we heard that before? just um, like Carboniferous forms. So there's one form here which looks like Rhinodipterus secant. It probably is. There's another smooth stalked form with a very, very high angle between the body and the stalk itself. An extremely long stalked form without the ventral, uh, ventral furrow in the middle there. And a form that's similar to Rhinodipterus secans but has got cosmine on the surface. And um, there's also some isolated bee bones that look different to a specimen I'm about to describe. But just throw a little Easter egg in here. There's also some tooth plates. And here are these tooth plates at the top from um, the, the Franian of, of Russia. They are uncannily, they uncannily resemble those of Tenodus from the Visayan of Scotland. I'm not saying they are Tenodus. I haven't looked at these, I haven't measured angles, I haven't counted um, tooth ridges, etc., etc. But what they do share it's the parallel nature of the tooth ridges, which is pretty much characteristic of Tenodus. So this might possibly be evidence, at least tooth plate evidence, of dragging Tenodus down into the Devonian and therefore implying that Tenodus was one of those taxa one of the, uh, that, that moved over the Devonian carboniferous boundary. But for the rest of the talk, I want to talk about this animal here, Latvius abrutus described by Vorobieva in 1977 as a, a, an uh, osteoleporform. It's a nice specimen. It's three-dimensional. Um, unfortunately, though, we're missing the front of it. So we just have the otocyptical region and the skull roof on top of that. So Vorobieva assigned it to the genus Latvius, primarily based on the abundance of lateral line pore canals on the top there. Latvius has uh, a, a great density of them, very numerous down the side of the, um, the, 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 the tabula there and going into the extra tabula. And um, you can see here that that's exactly the pattern, <laughs> so to speak, that we have in Latvia subrutus. But notice how she's divided, she's recognized some um, <coughs> post-parietals there. 
Now, if we look at the actual specimen itself, here it is. Um, some of the information, morphological information, isn't that clear from black and white photographs. But with a colour photograph um, and the specimen itself, you can see, a, see that manganese oxide has actually highlight, highlighted some of the sutures between the dermal roof bones. And if we trace these sutures, we can see a typical um, lungfish arrangement of dermal elements, including this medial B bone here, flanked by paired I bones, X bones, Y bones, and Z bones. And for those of you who don't know why lungfish have this strange um, alphanumeric coding for the, the, the bones, it's because a homology between, um, between, between other sarcopter regions and the parietals, the uh, tabulus, etc., etc., is very, very uncertain. So we prefer to use just, just letters. So, first piece of evidence that this is not nostiliperform is the presence of a lungfish-type dermal arrangement. <laughs> Looking at the posterior and having the fortunate um, ability to CT scan this specimen, we can then go and compare some of the, uh, the structures that Vora Bieva labelled on, on her 1977 reconstruction and interpretation there. Um, one thing of particular note is, let's take a look at this little hole here, this foramen there, labelled as X. So that's coming out of this flank here, okay? And also, if we follow that flank up, it goes up and supports the skull roof. So we have these two flanks supporting the skull roof. And those flanks are known as Christie, and they are characteristic of lungfish. The dermal skull of lungfish is supported by these bony struts called Christie. But at the back of this one, she's labelled um, nerve X, the vagus nerve coming out of it. Segmenting out or following in that, that foramen there, we see that it, it doesn't actually go into the brain cavity itself. It just goes into this cavity below the skull roof and above the neurocranium itself that would have housed um, the, the mass of the muscle. And we have one foramen here for the lateral division of it, the masseter and the medial division, and then right slap bang in the middle, the foramen for the uh, temporalis muscle. And this is very typical of lungfish. From the front, from the anterior portion, there's not a whole lot of sort of information other than what we can see inside. We can see there is an endocranial cavity in there, and it seems relatively uncrushed. Here's an interpretive drawing showing the, 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 the parts of the sacculus, which part of the inner ear labyrinth system, and even some of the, the labyrinths themselves. There's a little bit of crushing at the top. But um, having that sort of structure there visible from the specimen, it, think, it just begs for CT scanning and an endocast to be drawn from it. But before I describe the endocast, I just want to show you a good endocast of a lungfish um, uh, cranial cavity. This is done by Alice Clement and Per Alberg a few years back. And uh, endocast 101 at the front here, we've got olfactory tracts going into olfactory bulbs in the forebrain, the midbrain here, and uh, the hindbrain in this region with these large superoptic cavities flanked by the labyrinths, a spinal cord going out the back, and a notochord going out the back. In Latvius and Brutus, we don't have all of that. We've only got that much of it. So I'm expecting to see something a little bit like that. Unfortunately, this is like the most horrible endocast I've ever had the misfortune to work with. But there is some important phylogenetic information in there. Um, I should point out quickly with rhinodipterus, you can see in the sacculus region here, this big bulging structure, it's divided into two, a, a, an anterior one and a posterior one, with this notch in the middle, a saccular lagina notch. And that is something more common to actinops. It's seen in a few dipnoe, it's seen in uh, rhinodipterus kimberliensis, and also the more primitive um, lungfish dipterus. But what do we have? Well, um, on the top, Looking at the top there, we can see there are remnants of semicircular canals. There are large superotic cavities like rhinodipterus, uh, kimberliensis, and we can see trace the actual path of the nerves. But most importantly, on the bottom and the lateral view, we can see that there is a saccular lagina notch. Um, also, there's this small little fenestra or canal coming out of the side of the sacculus, an otic wall fenestra, which is found in more primitive dipnomorphs such as younger lepis. And this, what, we just, what I just want to show here is Vorbieva did get some things right. There's a large jugular groove down the side. That's a derived characteristic. And we can see from the, the, the endocast here where these little canals actually come out. Nerve 9, just behind nerve 10, and this little otic wall fenestra poking out the side. Very typical, very normal arrangement for a lungfish. 
all's well and good. So to compare this animal with some, uh, some sort of contemporary organisms, um, uh, let's look at how it compares to Rhinodipterus itself. Well, the skull roof is a, a very good place to, to look at. It, it contains, um, it's, it's very flexible, very malleable, and it's generally where we go to compare lungfish between each other. Now, you can see that Latvius brutus shares, excuse me, with Rhinodipterus, this connecting X bone and I bone. And this is only actually seen in a couple of other lungfish from the Carboniferous. It doesn't share that same configuration with Rhinodipterus kimberliensis. So where, do these an where does this animal lie? Well, in the parsimony analysis, it lies in a big bush down up at near the top. Rhinodipterus stolbovi, that very first specimen, crops out down here with another long-nosed, long-snouted form, Gryphonathus, which also has denticles. A Bayesian analysis gives some more resolution. Latvius occurs as uh, the sister taxon to this grade of Phanaropleurid florantid type um, lungfish, and Rhinodipterus also still stays down there next to Gryphonathus. But what's interesting about this is that Gryphonathus and Rhinodipterus, they're contemporary taxa from opposite sides of the world. Now, the biogeography of lungfish has been described um, and, 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 and postulated, and it, but, but described by other people before, Zarina in, included. But what hasn't been done is to sort of test the mechanisms of what could possibly have happened and how they could have distributed themselves around relative to their phylogeny and the time. So I did an analysis in the R-Package Biogea of bears, which basically infers ancestral states for range distributions of fossil organisms. So what I've done is I've divided the localities where they're found into West America, East America, Gondwana, East Gondwana, North Gondwana, South, South China, and then each of those, uh, th those regions corresponds to a color here. And we can see basically down at the bottom, blue represents the uh, lungfish originating in South China. They then move outwards and basically cover the entire world almost, all in the early Devonian. There's massive dispersal of lungfish in the early Devonian. Where are the lungfish? They're probably still out there to be found. So if anybody knows, of, well, people should look in early Devonian for uh, more lungfish and other things. Well, let's summarize this graphically. What's interesting is that they come from China down to East Gondwana. And then the next occurrence is in West America, not down the Retic Corridor. Why might this be? Well, this possibly could be to, because of a circumpolar current driving the fish around in that direction. I was very interested to see that the, the new anicodont from Morocco seems to have made it down that way. However, it could actually have still made it all the way around because it occurred in the middle Devonian. By the middle Devonian, while well, still in the lower Devonian, the lungfish then moved to East America, still in the lower Devonian, all the way to North Gondwana, still in the lower Devonian, all the way back again, and by the middle Devonian, they're going back and forth up the Retic Corridor and to West Europe, America. And by the upper Devonian, they go up the Retic Corridor from East Europe, America to East Gondwana and all the way back around again. So possibly a circumpolar current may have shut off by that time. So to conclude all of what I've said about these new taxa from Russia, I would like to say that Unusual, and this is probably the, the most exciting bit, these unusual tenodus type lungfish tooth plates might perhaps further blur the Carboniferous um, Devonian morphological boundary as the specimens that Jenny described do. Latvius abrutus is not an osteoleporform fish. It is clearly a lungfish, and it's a sort of bog standard upper Devonian type lungfish. Rhinodipterus is certainly not, Stolbova is not Rhinodipterus. Hangs out with the Gryphonathids, that's fine. But the initial lungfish geographic distribution, dispersion was actually clockwise around Gondwana rather than straight down the Retic Corridor. And it was very rapid. It occurred just in the Lower Devonian. So finally, I'd like to thank you all for staying on until just before lunch. And I'd like to thank these people here, Caladis Services and uh, University of Edinburgh Mori and Dalmet Fund for a little bit of pocket money. Um, Alexei Paknovich for CT scanning, Hannah Maunder from GCHQ for translating the papers from Russian, and Lauren Salen for, for some uh, discussions, and most importantly, the unsung heroes, 
The people, the locals of Stolbovo in Russia for collecting all the material way back in the 1930s onwards, as you see in the background there. Thank you very much. <laughs>